Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Sammy. Uh, where, where, where did I point? Um, oh, you know, facts. It's technology. Oh, oh, awesome. Thank you. OK, cool. Hi. I'm Sammy. I'm going to talk about, um, I'm not that tall. I'm going to talk about uh, computer hacking, because I think it's awesome. And it's really fun. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into computer hacking. Uh, it was basically as a child, as a lot of hackers and a lot of people who are just in love with what they do. Uh, my mom, my single mother, uh, spent sort of every penny she had when I was like nine or 10 and got me a new computer. And it was one of the best days of my life. And she got Hi, internet. Hack the planet. Um, so I got a computer and internet, and it was so cool. So I got on the internet, and there's just dozens and dozens of websites where you can just listen to like samples of X Files and Simpsons sound bites. You could just do this for days. It was incredible. So I got on there. I was listening to all this stuff. It was so cool. And then I found chat rooms, and uh, I found something called IRC. And IRC was so cool. It's basically a very simple chat type of chat room back in the day. They still have it today. Uh, but just very basic, um, very text-based. And I got on there, and I went into a random chat room, and I said, hey, like, who wants to, who wants to chat? Um, and someone said, get out of this chat room. And I said, what? Like, no, I just want to say hi. I'm like, no. He's like, you have 10 seconds to get out of this chat room. I said, okay. Um, no. <laughs> 10 seconds later, uh, my computer froze. My brand new computer that my mom spent every penny she had that day. And I panicked. Uh, it was also simultaneously the coolest thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> like, how did he do that? How can I do that? But I went back to panic mode. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Hope my mom doesn't find out. I turned the computer off. I turned it back on. Everything was OK. So like, thank God everything was OK. And from that moment on, I was just addicted. I was like, how do I do that? And later on, I found out there was something called WinNuke. And it was denial of service. Um, and there was an application that you could download to actually do this to other people. Um, I went back into IRC, and, uh, and then I learned, you know, you can actually write a program, you can actually write software to do this. So I then just spent the next rest of my life continuing, <laughs> <laughs> continuing to learn how to, you know, learn software. Um, I learned a lot of different applications, uh, spent a lot of time learning all these very sophisticated things. Um, <laughs> Many, many hours, many, many years, you know, grew up a little, got into high school, started playing Counter-Strike. And, you know, I continued, as I was learning to program, I also got annoyed at technology, and I thought, well, technology allows us to also improve things in our life. And in Counter-Strike, I, I listened to Winamp, and I wanted to change the song. There's no way to do that. So I had to, like, alt-tab into Winamp. This was 10, 12 years ago. And then my screen would get messed up, and I changed the song to go back into Counter-Strike. So I found out that I could actually write some software within Counter-Strike so I could control music. Um, and once I figured that out, I was basically in the internals of Counter-Strike. And then I learned, well, once I'm inside of Counter-Strike, I can actually kind of do anything within the software. I can control memory. I can, I can look at where footsteps are coming from. And then I can actually just <laughs> remove transparent. I, I can add transparency to everything. I can see where everyone is, where every weapon is. Um, I just became unstoppable. It was amazing. Uh, so, you know, uh, this is sort of what, what got me really into technology. It was like computer gaming and, and how to hack games. Um, and it was a few years later, uh, I was 19 at the time, that I got into social networking. Uh, it was actually 2005, and at the time, MySpace was the number one site on the internet. And MySpace was really cool because they really let you do, like, a lot of cool things with your profile. Uh, make it really, like, good looking. Uh, but... <laughs> There were certain things it couldn't do, like there were certain customizations that it couldn't do, and I thought that was a little bit limiting, despite everything else it allowed you to do. Um, so I thought one of the things I wanted to do was, you know, I was in a relationship, so I had my like relationship status set to an in relationship, and it's always a drop down. Basically, you can only choose from these certain things, and I wanted mine to say in a hot relationship, which was not an option. So I started investigating, and and then I discovered that there was a, an exploit on the page that allowed me to basically change not only the text, basically the text here, but I found that I could use that exploit to kind of do anything. I could control the computer of the user who was, who was coming to my page. So I changed it to in a hot relationship, a very subtle change. Um, then I found I could actually make people add me as a friend. I was like, that's cool, new friends. Um, I love chatting with people online. Uh, and then, this was 2005, do you guys remember when Google Maps came out? Yeah, Google Maps was the coolest, one of the coolest things ever, because before that, it was MapQuest. 
When you wanted to zoom, you had to click a button, and then the page would reload. And you want to go to the left, you'd click a button, the page would reload. And then Google Maps came out, and it was very, very cool, because you could just drag. And this was using the newest technology called Web 2.0, or Ajax. I was like, Ajax, that's really cool. Like, I got to learn this. Maybe I'll implement this into some of the MySpace stuff I'm doing. <laughs> and with Ajax, I found uh, I could actually do so much within the background of the page that the user didn't know it was even happening. Um, so I found that I could actually make the person who was coming to my page modify their own profile. So I thought it'd be funny if whomever came to my profile would update their own profile and add to the bottom, but most of all, Sammy's my hero. <laughs> Nothing malicious, just like kind of funny. And uh, I thought this was funny, so I added that. I left, the, I left the code whenever someone would come to my profile, they would add me as a friend. Um, so I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning and uh, I, I had no new friends. So <laughs> it's like, okay, well, how do I make this maybe work a little faster so I can show off this cool code that I wrote? I thought, okay, well, if I can make someone add me as a friend and add me as a hero, I can actually make that code go onto their profile. So when then someone visits their profile, they'll add me as a friend, add me as a hero. So by morning, I should have like six friends. <laughs> um, I went to sleep, I woke up the next morning, and I had 200 new friends. Um, and an hour later, uh, it doubled to 400 <laughs> new friends, and then it doubled, and then it doubled. And I kind of freaked out. Um, it went to about 10,000 by the time I was at work. It went to about 20,000 new friends. These are all in, individ, individual people, all logged in within MySpace, late 2005. Uh, went to 30,000, 40,000, and I was just freaking out. By about 50,000, I went, I was going to go home, but I thought, okay, if anything weird happens, MySpace had just gotten bought by Fox for half a billion dollars. If anything bad happens, I'm going to enjoy just my last meal. I'm going to go to Chipotle. Have a burrito. So good. And uh, I came home. By the time I came home, I had about 900,000 friends. And this is an actual screenshot from there. Um, half an hour later, I hit a million friends. Uh, not, I, and I couldn't stop it, right? It's like, a, it's like a cold. Like, you might be cured, but everyone else has it now. <laughs> couldn't do anything about it. So I'm just like, at this point, I'm just refreshing. Like, how fast is this going? Uh, and it was going very fast until a little over a million, uh, finally I refreshed and my profile was down. It said like, this profile is down. I'm like, okay, thank God. And I went to my girlfriend's page and I was like, well, what about her profile? Like, does it still say Sammy's my hero on it? And her profile was down. I said, oh no. I went to myspace.com and everything was down. Um, so within 24 hours, MySpace had gone down, uh, the number one site on the internet in 2005 at the time. Uh, and I didn't know what to do. Um, uh, so, I did nothing. I did nothing. And people started uh, emailing me and said, asking for like interview requests. They, they heard about this worm and people in the security community started deconstructing it. Um, and people were selling t-shirts online that said, Sammy's my hero. Uh, and in most interviews, they'd ask, have you ever heard from MySpace or, you know, the feds or anything? I'm like, no, actually no one's ever con contacted me at all. Like, nothing. Um, and Sort of a month went by and two months went by and I was like, all right, I'm in the clear. Like, that was pretty cool. I probably shouldn't do that again. But uh, six months go by and I'm walking down to my brand new car, this is, yeah, 19 or 20, um, and there are two guys standing next to my sweet car. And uh, <laughs> I'm like, I just got this car. I'm getting carjacked. And those two guys then say, Sammy. And I'm like, they know my name, MySpace. And I'm like, oh no. I walk up, two other guys come up behind me. They're like, Sammy? I was like, yeah. I'm like, we have a search warrant uh, for you. And I was like, oh my god, OK. Um, and then they all show me badges. One's Electronic Crimes Task Force, one's Secret Service, uh, one's LA uh, District Attorney, and the other was, uh, I believe it was, yeah, California Highway Patrol. <laughs> Seriously. Probably because of my sweet car. Um, and for the first time ever, something in the movie Hackers was true. I got raided. <laughs> by a dozen agents with guns into my apartment. They went through everything. They took everything that could have data on it. They took my computer, my Xbox, um, my cell phone, my iPod. Uh, simultaneously, another dozen agents were at my office, the company that I had started a few years earlier. Uh, so t at least 24 agents, all with guns, going through everything, and then they leave. And uh, 
and then that was it. I, I wasn't arrested at the time. And then for six months, I actually started fighting with the DA, I got an attorney. Um, and finally, uh, I went to court and they told me I could never touch a computer again, um, ever. And that I would have to pay a huge amount of restitution. Um, I got probation and I had to do 720 hours of Caltrans community service, which felt like a lot more. Uh, <laughs> It felt like a ton. <laughs> this was all thanks to the Patriot Act. Um, and what was really interesting about this whole ordeal is that MySpace never came after me. MySpace never did a thing. They actually tried to hire me from that event. It was actually the state, it was actually the LADA that came after me for criminal charges. Um, after about three years of literally never touching a computer, uh, my attorney and the DA agreed to get the restriction removed. Um, so I was back on, you know, back on computers, um, got everything removed, probation was over three years later, uh, paid off the restitution, and I became a normal citizen again, which is really cool. So I thought, you know, I'm not going to do that kind of stuff again. Um, you know, you have black hat and white hat hackers. Black hat are sort of malicious. Um, you know, white hat kind of like do good, maybe security people. I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, <laughs> but I figured I'd stop doing things that could be construed as illegal. Uh, or at least try. And for me, hacking is, it's really, it's a puzzle. It's just a puzzle. It's like, it's like a crossword puzzle or something where you're just trying to figure out a way, a way to solve something that there may not be an original way to do so, but, but it is possible. There just, it just wasn't intended to be that way. So after that, after I came back to computers, I thought, okay, I'm gonna still continue to hack, but I'm gonna do it in, in a good way. I'm gonna try to, you know, I, I love transparency. Um, I believe in transparency, it's very important to me. So I thought, you know, I'm just gonna try to expose things. I'm gonna try to expose security implications, flaws, et cetera, and uh, just be good. Um, yeah, so do you guys remember Amazon uh, talking about their drones recently? Uh, it was a kind of interesting story. The day before Cyber Monday, yeah, they, they came out and said they were gonna create drones um, flying around to drop off packages. And I'm all for awesome technology. Uh, but I don't like, I don't know how much I agree with drones flying around like dropping packages off and like hitting children and like, you know, you can, you can get drones for under, under a couple hundred dollars with crazy cameras. I mean, you can really hurt people too. Um, someone was really injured with a drone just recently. So I thought, okay, if they're going to like talk about this, like they're actually doing it and it's not just a marketing stunt, which I believe it is, um, we should at least demonstrate some of the security implications with drones. So. That day, I took the, the most prevalent consumer-based drone called the Parrot AR drone. It's like $300, has a 720p camera. You can control it from your iPad or your iPhone or your Android device. It's, it's really cool. Um, and I strapped a little computer to it called the Raspberry Pi, and I wrote some software that then hacks any other Parrot drone in the area and <laughs> takes it over <laughs> and turns it into a zombie drone. <laughs> so essentially, <laughs> You'll fly this drone around, and then it just starts collecting drones. <laughs> uh, and I released it all open source, and this was, I mean, this was possible within, within a day of them releasing that, that was entirely possible. People have demonstrated like hacking GPS. Um, I, I'm all for technology, but I think you know, we, we also need to think about the security implications and the implications of you know, how it affects us in, a daily, in our daily lives. Um, what is this technology capable of? Uh, but I do love drones. I mean, they have really cool, you know, they have really cool things, but it, you know, there's, there's always a double-edged double -edged sword, and I like people to sort of think about that. You know, what are the impl implications? What are the privacy implications? So I was thinking, like, who else? Like, who else has information on us? Um, obviously, Google. Um, Google's really cool. Uh, anyone know about the Google reverse image search? Yeah. yeah, it's very cool. You can just take an image. If you're into online dating, you can just take an image, drag it on there, uh, and it will tell you where else that image is on the web. So I just took a totally random photo, um, <laughs> and I dragged it in there, uh, just random one on my computer, and, and you, you just see all the pages that that image is on. So if you think you're anonymous on, say, a dating site, they can just take your image and drop it in there. Tineye.com is another great example. Um, so that's like a really interesting thing that people on dating sites might not really realize. Um, another thing that was really cool is an MIT team created something called Facebook Gaydar, and they were able to determine if someone was gay by their friends, even if they didn't actually uh, mention their sexuality. Based off of their friends, statistically, gay people will have a much higher percentage of gay friends. So you can actually just determine who is gay with, with that information. Um, you can determine religion with just the text on people's profiles. I mean, there's some really cool stuff out there. Um, there's a website called Please Rob Me. 
er everyone who went on Twitter and said they're coming here, please rob me, now says, you are not home, go rob this person. Uh, it actually just watches Foursquare, it watches Twitter, it looks at where, you know, who is not home. And it's, really, it's a really cool demonstration of this is what the, the information you're sharing. Uh, uh, Matt Honan is a, another really interesting case where hacking isn't always around technology. Sometimes it's just about social engineering and, and about information. Um, he's a Wired writer, and what had happened was maybe a few months ago, some hackers had compromised his, I believe, Amazon account, and within the Amazon account, uh, you can get the last four of your credit card numbers, uh, you have your credit card number in there. So that's sort of like public information to Amazon once, you know, once you're logged in. Uh, however, for Apple, that's actually security information. So they then called Apple and they said, hey, you know, I lost my password, here's the last four of my credit card. And the hackers gained access to his Apple account and iCloud account, and then gained access to his MacBook, and then his iPhone and his iPad, wiped them all, got into his email, took over his Twitter, Facebook, started doing racial profanities on his Twitter, um, and he wiped all of his data everywhere. Uh, no backups, or at least maybe his iCloud backups got wiped. And it, I mean, it was just devastating. And that's just from four numbers. I mean, literally four numbers. Um, you know, where else is that information? Uh, so sometimes, you know, we can't protect that information. Um, pictures are another great example. Do you guys know John McAfee? Uh, yeah, so McAfee, he, he created McAfee Antivirus, um, which got bought by Symantec. Uh, millionaire, lived in Central America, I believe, and went on the lam because supposedly, supposedly he had murdered his, his neighbor. Um, and Vice, uh, you know, some Vice writer or editor went basically on the lam with him and documented the whole thing and uploaded a picture and left the EXIF information of the camera with the exact GPS coordinates where they were that day. Uh, he was found a few days later because of this. Um, you know, I took, I took some random photos of just uh, a random person on Twitter and started documenting it. Um, you know, you could just take an image and start calculating, <laughs> calculating, you know, where that person is based off that EXIF information. Uh, I'm not sure whose car that is. Uh, <laughs> But that's just a, another place, you know, just your phone, whenever you're taking a picture, it, it's telling you, it's telling, it, it's inserting the GPS coordinates of where you are. Um, and that's really interesting, coordinates and, and phones and location, like location is, is a pretty interesting thing. Um, especially HTML5 geolocation, that's something I got really interested in. Uh, a few years ago, I heard that the web browser is able to now tell you where you are. So our laptops don't have GPS, our phones do, but our laptops do not. And I found this HTML5 geolocation uh, tool, this JavaScript code, was able to determine the exact address I was at uh, when it had come out. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. How does it do that? It's kind of scary, too. Um, and I found that Google, while they're doing Street View driving around, they're also monitoring for wireless networks. So if you're on a wireless network, they know where that wireless network is. So just on your laptop, which has no GPS, when you go on to Google or onto your web browser, they can actually determine the physical address that you're at based off triangulating the Wi-Fi network that you're on. Um, which I thought, you know, that was crazy, but also really interesting. And I started speaking about this, and, and I demonstrated how you could actually kind of hack this. Um, and I went to, I traveled to uh, all over the world, and uh, I went to one of my favorite places, um, which I'd never heard of at the time, uh, Bratislava in Slovakia, and I talked about this. And they said, you know what? Uh, well, that's good because Google's cars are illegal here. Google Street View cars are illegal here due to privacy laws in Europe. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Let's test it. And it still worked. I was like, huh, so is Google, like, I think you'd probably notice if one of those cars were there, right? Uh, yeah, one of those guys. Um, so if they're not using cars, what are they using? And I thought, uh, Android. That's the other thing Google has that's everywhere. And I was like, I, don't, I didn't think the Android phones were doing this because they're open source, and I investigated the, the source code and never saw this. So I looked again, and I saw nothing. I was like, well, I still don't know how they're doing it, so I'll start sniffing the connection. I saw some encrypted traffic, I decrypted that, and then I started driving down like Santa Monica Boulevard looking for like something to change in this weird obfuscated traffic, and I saw something incrementing. I was like, oh, and I found those were GPS coordinates. So our phones, Android phones, were just constantly sending GPS wherever you go. Um, and then I found, I was like, I wonder if iPhone does this. And the iPhone was doing this. And I wonder if Windows phones do this. And they were doing that. And they were all doing it encrypted and obfuscated and not telling anyone. And then I turned off my GPS, and then it still sent it. And then I tested it on my iPhone, and it still sent it. And then I tested it on the Windows phone, and it still continued to send my data, my GPS coordinates, where I was, um, illegally, after I had said no, uh, which was crazy. So, 
yeah, I would sort of I released that through the Wall Street Journal. All those companies got into class action lawsuits, went to Capitol Hill, uh, because that's illegal. Like, they were actually lying. Um, it's one thing to track somebody. It's another thing to tell them you're not. Uh, and, you know, I demonstrated how you could actually just come to my website, and I could tell you exactly where you were. I could actually pinpoint you down. Um, and I thought, you know, I like to do fun things, too. So I thought, how else could I use this information? And I found that the Google phone, while it's constantly sending this information, it's actually doing something kind of cool. It's, uh, it's finding out how fast you're moving, how fast you're traveling. So if everyone moving down Broadway is going 10 miles per hour, Google now knows everyone on Broadway is 10 miles per hour and can demonstrate that on Traffic View. And I thought, oh, interesting. OK, well, this is supposed to be anonymous, they say. It wasn't. Um, but I can create anonymous traffic. So I made a little app that uh, allowed me to essentially Google Maps. And I would say, I'm going from Santa Monica to um, you know, the independent downtown. And it would then route me down Olympic, for example. Uh, except what it would also do is it would then sound phase, uh, it would send thousands of fake Android requests saying we're all going zero miles per hour so that everyone else would see red on Olympic. <laughs> um, everyone. So everyone else would get routed to the 10. And if, and if you took the 10, <laughs> oh, oh man. <laughs> Uh, so that was sort of like the fun demonstration of, you know, how this data could be used in an interesting way. And now, I actually, I actually think this is cool. Like, I think this is actually a really cool use of data. Um, but what's important to me is that people know that it's being used that way. You know, when you, when you buy an Android phone, I just want you to know, understand that you're, you are being tracked. You might be okay with that. A lot of people are, a lot of people aren't. But that should be transparent to you, um, the user. Uh, so I thought, you know, that's, that was interesting. Um, so. <laughs> So really, I mean, essentially, essentially what I'm getting at is, you know, you should at least be in charge of your data and your information. Um, so I'd actually like to ask, who doesn't care that the NSA, the government, you know, whomever companies have all your data? Let me, let me hear you. Who doesn't care at all? A couple of people don't care? Okay. Very excited about not caring. That makes sense. Um, who kind of cares? Cares a little bit. Okay. People care a little bit, yeah. Who's like, I hate these people? OK. OK, cool. I don't care at all. I personally don't care at all. I think, uh, you know, I get a lot of cool stuff. I get a lot of free stuff out of all of this. I love Gmail. Like, Gmail is awesome. If you're using the other thing, you should mail client, you should switch to Gmail. Um, seriously, it's awesome. Uh, I love Google. Like, search. So much information at my fingertips. Um, I will exchange my privacy and my information for that. I don't think you should. I think everyone should have a choice. And I think we should bas basically sort of just understand what that choice is. What information are we giving up when we decide to use a service like Gmail or Google or our phone or Drive um, or go somewhere where there's Google Glass or use a Connect in your house which has a microphone and is constantly watching you. Um, or you know, go into, uh, yeah, somewhere where someone is wearing Google Glass and potentially monitoring you. Um, your DNA is everywhere, 23andMe. Has anyone used 23andMe? It's a really cool DNA testing service. It's very cool. It tells you all about your DNA. Um, I suggest use a different name because now your data is in the database. Your actual DNA is in the database. And I may have an exploit that can download that. Uh, that's for another time. Uh, Tesla is tracking you know, wherever you go. I mean, the, our phone, we have two cameras. One isn't enough. We have two. Um, and I love this stuff. This is really cool technology. I love it all. I want it all. Uh, but I also want to just understand you know, what's happening. So really, it's, it's a choice that you have to make. Um, just try to understand you know, when, when you are doing this sort of thing, when you are purchasing new technology, think about like, how's, that, how's that used? Is this a good idea? Am I OK with you know, the, the people who might have this information, the hackers who might use it in a weird way? Um, and, and make that decision based off that. And uh, that's, that's about it. Uh, you know, I'd like to, <laughs> privacy is going away. You know, I want you to realize that, and that's kind of okay. Maybe you can embrace that. I'm actually considering uh, making my email public for a few months, just like fully public, uh, fully transparent, just to see like what happens. Will I jump, jump off a building? I don't know. Uh, will it be really cool? I'm not sure. Uh, but I think that'd be kind of a cool experiment. And I uh, just wanted to thank you. Thank you, thank you for thank you. listening. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.